<laughs> I'm Ron Louie, and uh, Chief Peace Kearns is right down here. We're going to do a presentation uh, talking about police chief's perspectives on what impacts police officer behavior and performance. Before we get really into it, because Chief Kearns is going to start off, I want you to know a couple things. First of all, you see, uh, we don't want to kill you by the PowerPoints. All the material that you see up here is, uh, your, is available to you. And including our text, my textbook on tactical communication and crisis incidents. You may have it, you can't sell it, but you can keep it. Um, at least that's what my publisher tells me. Um, a, a lot of you are here also for uh, CE continuing education. So uh, to let you know that um, we will, uh, these are the learning objectives that we're going to be going through real quick, real quick. Um, uh, for today's session. Uh, again, how to nurture a value-driven police organization. And I'm giving you the answers too, by the way. Uh, Chief Kearns, through compassion, humility, and empathy. Uh, identify police officer impairment factors. Again, these are your, this is what we want to try and accomplish in the short time that we're together. Uh, what are the impairment, misuse of force, domestic violence in their own lives, suicide, police suicide. Citizen complaints, career self-sabotage, absenteeism, some abuse field relationships. So these are all the answers. Uh, what are some effective strategies to intervene and reduce police officer impairment? This is huge. And in the police community, um, I gotta tell you, we just don't even know where to go with this yet. <clears throat> but I got good news. Starting in Oregon, of all places, we are starting to deal with uh, recognizing off uh, officer emotional intelligence and mindfulness-based training, which we believe in the long run, uh, where we're going with this is we're gonna start, Chief Kearns and I are gonna be internal. We're gonna talk about uh, uh, police officers. But if, if, if we prepare our officers properly, when they go into the field and meet your clients, they'll do a better job. That's, where we're, that's why we were asked to be here. Uh, not to talk about mental health way over here. Uh, by the way, I, <laughs> Editorial con, sorry, Pete. <laughs> Pete first, but everybody keeps talking about mental health, mental health, killing people, shooting people. Sometimes people are angry and mean, they just kill people. They're not, everything's not mental illness. I don't know why, and I'm a cop, but why are we putting everything into the mental health? I just feel so sorry for the, my wife's a nurse, and she says the same thing about, <laughs> we seem to be talking about mental health is, is everything, and it's, it's a chimera. And my personal opinion, it's not. Uh, which training models show the most promise in preparing police officers for the uncertainties of a crisis intervention call? And again, many of you in this room, you have to deal with the result of that call. Uh, tactical communication skills de uh, designated, designed to de-escalate. And finally, why is post-traumatic stress injury as a term more acceptable to police and military culture? And briefly, <laughs> disorder is more of a label an injury clarifies that a person has experienced something horrifying or traumatic and can recover for it. I think mental health professionals told me that. Uh, but somehow, everybody gets it wrong and talks about disorder. Uh, so I wanted to set it up. And uh, I'm going to get the chief up here. By the way, I'm senior to him, but he's making me put this whole thing together. So I... Because he, he just retired, and I got a problem with that. Let me get, let me get this down here. There we go. By, by the way, that was Hong Kong, my favorite city. Here we go. Pete Kearns uh, just retired from, uh, here we go, Pete, just retired from um, Eugene Police Department. And uh, he drove all the way up here, had a late lunch, has to drive all the way back to Eugene. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, to work with uh, Pete, I've known him for a long time, he's ran a, a stellar organization in Oregon, and I'm going to turn it right over to Pete, and then I'll take over after Pete, and of course then we want to have a Q&A &A after that. Chief, all yours. All right, thank you, Chief. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, adequately? Um, so we uh, at the Eugene Police Department in the 1980s, we created this relationship with an uh, outreach clinic called White Bird Clinic in Eugene, and we have a contract with them, and they provide a service of outreach workers uh, that respond to calls for service, and it's been a spectacular service that we have in Eugene. But I'm not going to talk about that today. 
And uh, we also, uh, shortly after I became chief, required that every officer and now every dispatcher and soon every employee will receive the crisis intervention training. And that has been uh, pretty beneficial for the department and the community. Uh, but that isn't what I'm here to talk about today either. What I'm here to really talk about is the culture change that had to happen within our department, which enabled those things to serve us well and serve the community well. And uh, the conditions that existed when I became chief, a couple of them that are important to know, is that uh, first of all, um, Eugene is a pretty politically liberal community. It's not, diver it's not racially diverse or necessarily culturally diverse, but it is extremely diverse in terms of thought and uh, political views. And uh, folks are pretty vocal. It has a large university that's in the center of the community, and that influences a lot of the thinking. And for a uh, regulatory organization, we've just had sort of a tenuous relationship with the community, which is not built to a strong sense of trust for the many years, you know, previously. So that's one condition. And then the other, another condition is that uh, we went through quite a few protests in the 1990s in the first part of the next decade. Uh, we had an anarchist movement there, and the police handled that well sometimes. Sometimes we didn't handle it well, and there was a lot of, there were bad feelings that came out of that. In 2002, we convicted two police officers of rape, totally unrelated criminal uh, activities, but one officer had raped two women while on duty, and he was sentenced to five years in prison. He's since been released. The other officer raped 17 women, some violently on duty. Uh, most of them were prostitutes, heroin addicts, alcoholics, and or all of the above, and he'll spend the rest of his life in prison. And so all of this sort of created a pretty you know, contentious relationship between police and the community, and police didn't trust the community, the community didn't trust the police, it just wasn't healthy. And one of the things that came out of that was a charter amendment uh, that was enacted uh, by a, a majority vote of the community uh, that put in place an independent police auditor uh, that reported, its independence was to report to the city council rather than the city manager and uh, that went into effect in October of 2007, which is almost exactly one year before I started as chief. And the first year of that was the rockiest. By the end of the year, uh, the auditor had gone to another job and the police chief had gone to another job. And so me and the deputy auditor were left with what remained, you know. And so uh, my first day uh, at, at work as the police chief uh, was to receive a letter from the city manager, who was a, a, an exceptional uh, leader to work for. And uh, in that letter, among the things, the expectations he detailed for me was to uh, improve relations with the community. And um, so the, the culture within the community had to change a little bit, but I didn't have any control over that. The, the culture within the department had to change, um, not substantially, but it did have to change. And so this is sort of the story of how that happened. Um, So um, the way that we began was we had these uh, listening sessions. The city manager had a relationship with a facilitator, professional facilitator, who was uh, remarkably good at bringing communities together. And so we had a series of uh, these listening sessions where there'd be about 20 people involved, half of them police officers, half of them members of the community. They'd sit together in a circle. You know how when you show up for in-service training and you think you're going to have a nice day and then you see all the chairs in a circle and you realize, oh, yeah. yeah. So that's what, that's what it was. We didn't handpick officers who we thought would be pleasant to be with in there. Officers were required to go. We have 180 officers. We couldn't go to all of them, but we, we took a cross-section of our workforce and they didn't choose to go. Some of them were grateful to be there. Many did not like that they had to go sit in a circle and communicate with uh, members of the community. And the, the community representation was like activists, so there was a history with activists that wasn't positive. Uh, co uh, communities of color, uh, business uh, community, other leadership, and so on. And there were many of these uh, listening sessions. I attended each of them, and it was pretty remarkable. So the way that each of them would begin, we'd sit in a circle and uh, people would cluster together naturally. We didn't do anything to change that. Facilitator went around and asked, uh, so why are you here and uh, what do you hope to get out of today? That was the first question. And community members uh, were pretty optimistic about what they uh, hoped to achieve. Uh, police officers, some would be excited about being there. Uh, more than half of them would be there with their arms crossed. 
across their chest and they would say, uh, I don't know why I'm here. I'm here because I was ordered to be here. I have no idea what to expect. And the first time I saw this, I thought, this is going to be interesting. And, uh, and then the next questions were, the way this was facilitated, and I'd recommend this to anybody that's in a situation like this, is that uh, the question was, what is the relationship between the community and the police, and how did it get this way? And so uh, the way it worked is that a community member would speak. They'd tell the story of how, what, what the situation was and how it got there, and they would look directly across the circle to a police officer. The police officer's job was to listen intently to what they're saying and then repeat when they're done. They could take as long as they felt they needed to. When they're done, repeat exactly what they heard. They didn't paraphrase. They didn't try and find different words that summarize. They said exactly what they heard. They didn't comment. They didn't editorialize. They cast no judgment. And so there, and then the uh, could be that police officer or another one would then do the same thing. And there'd be backups to make sure that everything that they heard. I tell you this, the power of this uh, speaking and listening and repeating back was unbelievable. I'm not exaggerating. It was unbelievable. And by the end of these sessions, that would take three or four hours, they always took an hour longer than we planned, uh, they would be hugging one another at the end and walking out. So this, we, the, um, the facilitator had a theory about how much of the workforce and how much the community needed to be involved in order for this shift in the relationship to happen. So it went on for days. I don't remember exactly how many at this point, uh, but it was arduous, and I think it was pretty powerful. So that's one thing that we did. Um, the other thing is uh, that, um, you know, I had in my mind, uh, not this origi initially, this crystallized idea of what change needed to occur within the police department in order to provide the service I think our community wanted. But I knew, um, I knew that we needed, we have 350 or so face-to-face -face contacts with the community every single day. We're a police officer, and this doesn't even count all the detectives contacts or all the record specialist contacts at the front counter. These are police officers that are showing up at a call and talking to a little old lady who's been burglarized or talking to a homeless person who is in crisis or, or who has committed a crime or any, any of the myriad things that police officers go to. 350 a day, 350 opportunities to impress the community with how much we want to serve them to the very best of our ability. And uh, I, we'd gotten to a place where that level of service was not discourteous, you know, which is a pretty high standard, but you'd like to see that in your workforce. We wanted to be not discourteous. That was, we weren't discourteous, frankly, but we weren't kind and gracious and helpful in every single encounter, and we needed to be. So my, the question I had to deal with is how to transition us to that. And so, uh, you know, you never want to waste a uh, good crisis. Of course, I would never want the country to have to go through what it experienced after the Ferguson, Missouri incident. Uh, but once you're in the middle of a crisis, you, do have, you should ask yourself, what can, how can I capitalize on this situation that we're in? And fortunately, the Police Executive Research Forum, which is one of the, it's the police association in the United States that I admire the most. Because when they, in their inception in the early 1980s, uh, they started in Boston, and they made a relationship e immediately with Harvard. And so that, that uh, beginnings of their organization have ensured that every single police uh, or law enforcement factor that they consider has an academic uh, contribution. You know, it has a relationship and has lessons in academia. So everything that the Police Executive Re Research Forum recommends to law enforcement is well-founded in in academic studies. And at the time uh, that all this was happening, uh, PERF was talking about uh, legitimacy. How can a government institution be seen as legitimate by the people that it serves, which is pretty important. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, in 1969, during the, in Ireland, during the Troubles, uh, a, a military commander was sent to Belfast to deal with uh, the growing uh, turbulence that was occurring there, violence and bombings and so on, uh, it was just, it, it was practically nothing as it turns out compared to the years that followed uh, due to his approach to putting down that violence. Extremely oppressive door-to-door -door searches, civil rights were, uh, were thrown out the window by the government 
and uh, knocking holes in walls and pictures of the stomping on pictures of the Pope by young soldiers who, you know, were venting their anger that they had from the violence that they'd experienced from the Catholics and. Uh, it just so year after year after this extremely oppressive style of policing went into effect in Northern Ireland, the violent the number of deaths per year went up, the number of bombings went up, the number of, you know, the property damage went up, until decades later, Great Britain decided we need to take a different approach. Uh, and then another example of how legitimacy can be built, whereby the people who an organization is serving, they're seen as uh, an organ, uh, uh, institution that they should cooperate with is what occurred in Brownsville, New York. This is in 2002, I believe, but in the 1990s, um, most of the, more than 60% of the adult men who lived in Brownsville, uh, almost entirely African-American neighborhood, uh, had been to prison, and they'd been sent to prison by the New York City Police Department. So uh, by the time that this story occurred that I'm about to share, uh, uncles, fathers, uh, brothers, uh, grandfathers had all been in and out of prison and there was no respect for the New York City Police Department, not seen in this neighborhood as uh, a legitimate organization. So the um, uh, commander in that precinct decided that, uh, you know, uh, unaware of this, uh, the circumstance that they were facing, the, the enormous roadblock that they were facing, uh, recognized that there was an increase in street robberies in the neighborhood associated with uh, housing developments. So there's about 160 young men that uh, were committing crimes, and they figured these young men in their lifetime were responsible for over 5,000 serious crimes. And so she put together a, a team of officers who each had their own families that they needed to work with that had a youth in their household or in their apartment uh, who was committing crimes. And they just came to roadblock after roadblock. Uh, they'd get the door shut in their face. One of the officers, a gifted guy, uh, discovered a few days before Thanksgiving that, um, uh, that the family, one of his families didn't have a Thanksgiving meal. So he and his colleagues put some money together, bought dinner for Thanksgiving, delivered it to this family. They opened the door, brought him in, and hugged him. He goes and tells his commander, I mean, there's days, you know, less than three days before Thanksgiving, tells his commander what happened. She goes to her boss, and they fill a refrigeration, refrigerated truck with Thanksgiving meals, and they deliver them to all their 160 families who welcome them in, and the relationship changed like that. They were seen as a legitimate people who could help them improve the lives of their sons. And then they put into effect all the wraparound services that those young men and women were going to need in order to improve their lives, along with this backdrop of if you commit an offense, you're going to get in serious trouble. And the crime rate among that, co that cohort of young men dropped dramatically. So in my head, as I'm leading our organization, I'm realizing, you know, the, the people, we don't have a ghetto in Eugene, but we do have this pretty relatively large homeless population. And I'm talking about the chronically homeless, mental, severe mental health conditions, drug and alcohol addiction, and all of the above, uh, who have been forgotten or neglected by society. And the reality is, our officers could pretty much treat them within the law any way they wanted to, and it really wouldn't be noticed by anybody but this community. Now that's, that's pretty broadly stated, but um, that's, that's a truism. Society wasn't caring for uh, the chronically homeless uh, very well, and we had that day-to-day -day enforcement contact with them, and I knew that that had to be, just as an example of the many things we had to do well, that's something we had a duty to do as well as we possibly could. So... Um, what, I, what I decided is, we, at about this time, we were creating a new strategic plan. And uh, with every strategic plan, you have values. Some people, some organizations will have 15 values. I decided we would have three values. You can pick whatever you want as long as one of them is compassion. I knew compassion had to be central to what we were going to do. And, and then uh, it was. And as soon as uh, we'd identified our values and long before we completed our strategic plan, I started lecturing at our monthly in-service about the meaning of our values, uh, integrity and compassion and courage, and I had, length, I had about a half hour presentation on each of them, and I always included examples of how uh, historical figures within our department, notable police officers from our organization that people respected and had storied careers, had embodied the, um, these values. So I always had examples 
side-by-side -side examples that our officers could respect uh, and, and contemporary police officers also that embodied the values. And at the end of every training session, I would be sure to read the commendations, uh, and I'll share a couple with them, of them with you later, the commendations that, uh, sh that, that showed where officers had demonstrated those. And the remarkable thing is that many of those commendations came from third-party observers who watched our officers make an arrest or, or address a person in crisis and how amazed they were that, that someone could be so kind and gracious and compassionate. I kept hearing the word compassionate come back. And when I spoke with our officers, I made no bones about it. The objective of what I'm about to share with you and, those, and these values and our strategic plan is to transform this organization. That's what we're going to do. And if you make decisions that are exclusively based on our three values, you can say that every value is represented in your decision making, your action, I'll, I will support it 100%. So that was, the, um, that was the way that I approached all this with them. So the one that I'm, the only one I'm going to share with you here is compassion. And, uh, and so uh, this is a little bit of the lesson that I gave them. And uh, every, I'll ask the group, if, what do you know about uh, humility? And someone will have a story about how they learned uh, humility, so it was a nice way to carry on the class. Empathy is one of the most critical subjects, and so we would talk about what the meaning of empathy is to us. And the, the interesting thing is really police officers see people in every setting and every kind of circumstance. We stop people over and over for running a red light. And we know that every time we stop somebody, that person is uh, worried or scared or upset or whatever. We know 100% of the time how they're feeling. Our, we should be extremely good at empathizing with what that is. So you all know who, many of you know who Daniel Goleman is probably. He sort of invented the concept of uh, emotional intelligence. Okay, so he... Um, uh, he has lectured on empathy, and part of his book on emotional intelligence discusses the subject of empathy, and he gives this study as an example. Uh, the Divinity, Princeton Divinity students were uh, subjected to a study. They didn't know that they were participants in the study. There's something about being a college student that means that you will be in a study someday, I think. And so the way this study worked is uh, all these Divinity students, and I'm just picturing a hundreds of them, uh, they had an assignment one day of preparing a mock sermon. And half the students were given a random passage from the Bible, and the other half of the students were given uh, the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So just so I know how uh, much I should share with you about this, how many of you know the story, understand the story of the Good Samaritan? Please raise your hand. Okay, so for the rest of you, I'm going to tell a little bit about the story. Now, this is not a Bible lesson. This is just uh, to help you understand what this study is all about. This, this, the parable of the Good Samaritan, basically an elder asked Jesus, what do you expect of us? And Jesus says, I expect you to love one another. And this story explains how to go about that. So uh, a Jewish man is walking down the road uh, to Jerusalem, and he's attacked, beaten, and robbed, and he's laying on the side of the road, and he's probably going to die. A priest who you would expect to stop and care for someone who is injured uh, sees him and walks past. And then a Levite who is uh, an aristocrat in Jewish community walks by this person. You'd expect him to stop and help, but he doesn't. He walks by. Of all people, a Samaritan, and the Samaritans and the Jews were sort of warring or tribes. They didn't get along. They were known to dislike one another. Of all people, a Samaritan is the one who stops, cares for him, takes him to an inn, tells the innkeeper, give him whatever he needs to be, become healthy, and then when I come back, I'll pay for it. And so Jesus says, this is what I expect of you. Okay, so the, the expectation one might have of this study is that the students who prepared the sermon on uh, the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan, will be, you know, because they've been concentrating on it, they would be inclined to stop and help people who are in need when they have that on their mind. So the way the studied work is that every student had to walk across campus and they all individually walked past an actor who was in severe medical distress, bent over moaning and needed help from somebody. And the students who prepared the sermon on the Good Samaritan were just as unlikely to stop and help that person as all the other students. There was no difference. And so when they uh, asked uh, when they did the interviews later and they asked why 
it, said, it basically came down to, well, I didn't have time. I had to get there in time to do my sermon. So some people took the time and made it work. Others, And if you think of your own life, and I've thought of mine, I've been willing to sort of look at something in the corner of my eye because I have to get gas before I get to my next meeting or what have you. So I totally get it. So this is the lesson that uh, Daniel Goleman takes from that. The good thing, and it's really important for police officers to see that top line because there's so many messages come to a police officer that tells us that uh, we're not compassionate or kind. We get a lot of those messages. It's nice to know that this doctor says we're all hardwired to be compassionate. We are all made that way. We're inclined to be compassionate. And every day we're on this uh, continuum that ranges from complete self-absorption, which is where I live a lot of my day, but we're in complete self-absorption, or we're noticing something, and if we can notice it, we can stop and understand it and, and develop some empathy with that thing, that person. And then once we have some empathy, we can make a decision to be compassionate, and there, there's an act of compassion. And so we talked about this in in-service over and over, is that we're all, we should, when you're on duty, as soon as you walk in the door and you put your uniform on, I expect you to be poised to notice. The complete self-absorption stops. And if you can notice, then you can be empathetic and compassionate. And, of course, there's plenty of examples of how they've done that. So the other thing that has occurred during this whole period since uh, the incident in Ferguson, Missouri, and all the lessons that law enforcement has tried to take from that is, uh, this, uh, is this, the question about the sanctity of life, that we should go out there every day and we should consider the life of um, the suspect that we arrest, the life of the person, if it's an escaped convict who's holed up in a house with a machine gun and he's holding off police, that life is just as valuable. We're going to protect that life just as much as we protect the life of the person who's in emotional crisis and totally not their decision, and they're holed up in a house with a machine gun and they're holding off police. Both those lives are as important as the neighbors who need to be protected and the police officers who are there trying to deal with it. All those lives are important. We don't sacrifice our life in order to save their life. We don't sacrifice their life to save some others. So the whole plan, all the tactical, every the approach, the way we take the call, every single thing should be based on how do we approach this in a way so that everybody survives. And you'd think this would be such a simple thing to, to get, but police for decades and decades have been approaching situations that says, uh, my life's at risk. at risk, I don't have to move my feet, I can stand here, and if I'm approached by someone who has a, a, what I perceive to be a deadly threat, I'll use deadly force. And when we really totally buy into this, we suddenly have to start changing the way we approach things. We're willing to move our feet and get some distance and time and talk and find alternatives to the circumstances that would lead to the use of deadly force. So buying into that is all part of this compassion thing. And then proportionality is pretty critical. So um, to give you an example, uh, there's this the, a call that uh, us, our, a couple of our officers were dispatched to at a laundromat in the middle of the night, 2.30 in the morning. Uh, an angry man is in a laundromat, refuses to leave. The manager was called out. He's down there. He calls police and says, he won't leave. I want him arrested. So a lieutenant was nearby. So two officers and a lieutenant show up. And when they walk up, the, uh, there's a grocery cart outside with all of his possessions. And I don't know if you've ever seen somebody lose all their possessions but it is devastating. I mean, it is heart-wrenching to watch that happen. So if he's arrested, that's one thing that he's going to lose. And next to that was a large bag of returnable cans. You've probably seen these big bags of cans that people collect. So that's his life savings. He would lose his life savings potentially if he was arrested. They go inside. He's angry. He's refusing to leave. The manager says he needs to go. And so the officers are thinking, well, A plus B equals C. We make an arrest, and this thing will be over. But one, one thing to be aware of is that people who live on the street, I don't think it's 100%, but it's a pretty close to 100% of them are armed with a knife. And they're armed with a knife for protection. They're armed with a knife to open a soup can, to fix their bicycle. To, they have to have a knife. It's a, it, it's a critical tool. So angry man with a knife, we get in a fight. It probably won't lead to a deadly force encounter, but it certainly could. And so then for a trespass, 
and we don't know why he's trespassing yet, could end in a fatality. And one of the fatalities could be a police officer. So the lieutenant, and that's the, that's the way law enforcement has been conducted for decades. If A plus, a plus B equals C, it may be lawful, if it could also be awful, but if it's lawful, then it's okay. Well, that's not the measurement any longer. So the lieutenant manages to get from this angry guy that the reason he's there is because we don't know if it's a decade ago, a year ago, a day ago, but the laundromat owes him a dollar and change, and he's not leaving till he gets it. So the manager is not understanding, so the lieutenant gives the manager a dollar, the manager gives the guy a dollar, he leaves, and he's no longer a problem. So that's a solution that's proportional to this. Now, he might have committed a crime, and he could still get a ticket for trespassing, but he's not separated from all his stuff. So that's, that's the thinking. I could give story after story where our officers have gone, oh, so I don't need to put my life at risk to still get to the same conclusion. Put my life at risk means putting their life at risk. So that's what this is all about, this proportionality. It gets into so much of what we do. And then this is all part of the sanctity of life. We need to buy into this, that uh, we do have this priority of life in law enforcement. This is a reality that we need to live by. We're going to protect the most innocent people involved, the neighbors, the, the hostages, the victims. We're going to make sure the police officers can survive so that they can continue to do their job. But we need to put the suspect and the subject that called us there in a higher place and say, okay, if we, if we absolutely had to end this so that all three parties survive this, how would we go about it? And you tend to come up with different solutions than we have in the past. Uh, and then we talk about, you know, our officers make lists like this. What are the benefits of being compassionate? And the bottom line is that it builds that legitimacy that we have to have. And then I talk about my expectations. Treat one another well. We treat every person we work with well. We treat everyone with uh, kindness and respect. We don't wait for, to be treated kindly to, in order to treat them with respect. So that was, for some people, that was a change in thinking, you know. Uh, and then, oops, sorry. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So what the, the experience that, um, that uh, we've had with this, and there are other efforts that we've undertaken, is that um, the department has gone from one that, and I'm speaking very generally, a long time ago was officious. And I, I came in through the organization. I started as a reserve and worked my way up the ranks. So I know from personal experience that we were too officious. And we went, we've gone to a place where now when our officers are asked what they're most proud of of their department, one of the things they say is that, is how compassionately they treat the people. And there are countless stories of officers buying boots and so on. But I'll just share this one uh, with you that's pretty typical, but it's kind of, kind of cool. One of our officers, he's a, he's a tough guy. You know, he knows all the prostitutes and drug dealers and burglars that are in his beat, and he makes a lot of arrests of people who deserve to be arrested. And uh, he's sent to a thrift store, you know, a secondhand store like uh, Goodwill or St. Vincent de Paul, and uh, he knows the woman who's there uh, that's been caught shoplifting. Uh, she uh, has been separated from her little girl uh, because, of, probably because of her behavior, and uh, it's her little girl's birthday's coming up. She's going to get to uh, see her on her birthday. She's got a nice dress. She wanted some shoes that match, so she stole some shoes. It was dumb. She shouldn't have done it. She got caught. So the officer, uh, who knows her, they know each other, um, issues her the citation for trespassing, and then he buys the shoes for her so that she can have a nice outfit when she sees her kid. Sorry about that. Anyway, so there, there's just countless stories like that, mostly from third parties who see our officers do things. I'm just so proud of that, you know. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Uh, but thanks. Can't even begin to tell you how uncomfortable it is to get like that, you know, in front of a group, particularly when I don't know anybody. So if you promise not to ever. <laughs> oh, sure. So anyway, that's our, that's our story, and there's a lot more that I, could, I will share with you later if you have questions. I'll hand it off to Ron. Thank you. What we're gonna, thank you very much, Pete.
What I want to do is uh, carry on from what Pete had to say. <clears throat> and again, as I said earlier, all, all the uh, slides, this is more for me to keep track of what I'm talking about. Because if I don't have that up there, I'll wander. As a matter of fact, when I'm teaching, I I'm now an adjunct professor of criminal justice at Portland State. If I go off track, my students get out 10 minutes early. Every time, I, is that right? I got some of my students right there. Uh, you're getting extra credit, don't forget to remind me. Um, <clears throat> so, <laughs> what I want to do is kind of lead off from what Pete, and then I want to give us enough time uh, where there might be a question and answer, because some of what Pete's talking about and what I'm going to be talking about is a little different uh, within our agencies. And uh, what I want to start off with is, again, thanks to Pete. Can you see there, that? Look at this. I got the, look, this, what, look at this one. That's, yeah, that's from China. That's a Benford 5000. Look at that bad boy. <laughs> I look at that, I got, that's kind of wimpy. Um, this is where we want to go for the, the, this part of the session. Value-driven organization, that's what Pete's talking about. But we want to talk about impairment factors, uh, what are strategies to deal with them. Because again, what Pete talked about, what I'm talking about, is eventually how can we have a police force that goes out into the community, and again, many of your clients and do the right thing. Because on a daily basis, we're just seeing heartache after heartache of, of mishandled uh, calls and misuse of police force, which is tremendous. Um, so what are the, the impairment factors? And again, I'm walking through this quickly so that you don't have to focus in on that because you at your leisure can, can review all this because the, um, uh, the conference coordinators are going to provide all this for you. So what I want to do is use this as my notes. Uh, including the uh, uh, talking about attack of communication, but what's the research? I'm going to go back here real quick. What are the research findings on you know? What are the dismal stole, uh, toll? I'm going to talk with police stress. I want to show you one thing real quick. I'm not going to talk about it. There's a screaming sergeant. I want you to know something. A significant amount of police stress comes from within the organization, usually caused by poor leadership and dumb rules and policies. It's true. I, I was a police chief for 20 years. I was a cop 33, and I served in two different agencies. I'm from Palo Alto, California, but I'm a native of San Franciscan. And I can tell you, and Pete can tell you, as we were moving up the ranks, our stress, we used to love to go to bank robberies. You know why? There's going to be someone there robbing a bank, and that's kind of clear. But coming back to the station and getting chewed out by a sergeant and a lieutenant, and we know we're smarter than they are, is really difficult. But that's true. But here's what I want to show you real quick. What are the impairment factors? Now, these are the officers going out to your call. Our suicide rate is 8.4 times higher than everybody else's. Obesity, depression. I know there are a lot of mental health professionals in here. Depression, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Uh, sleep, wow. One third of all cops on duty in Canada and America absolutely are sleep deprived right now. One third. Now, can you imagine what kind of decision making you have? Uh, and that's what this study here, uh, sleep deprivation is, is horrendous in imperfect decision making. Uh, and of course, brain cancer. By the way, I'm, <laughs> Pete, you, know, you haven't seen this yet, did you? The risk of brain cancer is higher uh, if you have 30 or more years of police service. So. That's us. Um, by the way, they used to say police chiefs would last five years after retirement, and then we'd, we'd die from heart attacks. So we're trying. There, I'm going somewhere with this. How healthy can we keep our force? How mentally and physically healthy can we keep them? Impairment factor. The leading cause of death is post-traumatic stress disorder, or I call it stress injury. I'll talk about that in a minute. That's the leading cause of death against the pol uh, with police. People don't know that. I think it's getting shot by, by the bad person. Uh, the consequences of not dealing, and now mental health professionals use the word disease, I don't. Uh, I call it an injury, it can be explosive PTSD. On the officer, many police officers with PTSD aren't even aware they have the problem. They remain on the street doing their job, often without help or support. It's part of the department's culture of just dealing with it. Isn't that right? Military, those of you that served in the forces know exactly what I'm talking about. I served four years as a Marine, 
And can you imagine complaining about not feeling good in the Marine Corps? Well, and I don't think we make the best cops. <laughs> but my point being is, like police officers, the military uh, suffers in silence. Suicide by inches. Again, you're at your leisure. I don't want to. I want you to focus, but I want you to be able to read this. It says 400. It's much higher than that. Three, four times as many police officers die by their own hand than by assailants. You need to understand that. And by the way, I need to tell you, the death rate on cops has gone down significantly than when Pete and I started. It was almost twice as high when we were on the street. But right now, most people aren't recognizing the fact that the impairment factor for cops is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of um, police officers take their lives every year. Many because they are suffering in silence. Marriages dissolving. Person well, 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 let's talk about this. Personality trait of police officers is different than those most outside profession. Many come to, them, uh, come to mind, but it's safe to say police officers are accustomed to calling the shots. They're accustomed to getting their way, and they have the ability to deprive citizens of freedom. No one can say they have that. So you got a police officer with a much higher 60% or so divorce rate empathic response. Am I truly empathetic? Not necessarily. Do I want to communicate with her? Yes. So I won't yell. I'll tilt my head a little bit. My body language will change. I'll have a conversation, not an order. Because 55% of communication is your body. 38% is your tone of voice. Only 7 or 8% is the words you use. I didn't learn that as a cop. I'm, my other life, I was an anthropologist. And I, I learned that from the primates. No, we're not related. Well, we are, but never mind. So if at least the officer is saying, ma'am, tell me what happened, or she's sitting there crying, she's got a knife, she's holding it to her, to her throat, and I'm standing back here so she's not going to harm anybody, my job is, first of all, to get down to her eye level, maybe get back over here, just in case, I'm not stupid, she has a knife, and I try to talk to her. No, why am I doing this? Well, I've got 10 cops behind me with machine guns on her. Once I didn't, once I went to call and 10 of us had guns out on, on some guy with a knife, and after it was all over, Sergeant walked over me and he says, Louie, you didn't have your gun out. Why not? I said, well, Sergeant, if I shot him, like everybody else, all 10 of us would have to write a stupid report. The other thing is, these guys are quicker than I am. Uh, I don't need my gun. So I'd go like this. I'd go eye level, tilt my head just a tad to the right. Primates like to do that. Lower my voice. Distract her. How would I distract her? My name's Ron. What's your name, ma'am? Morty? Mort M O R G E N? G. I'm the, I, I apologize. What did I just do? Come on. I just distracted her. What happens when you distract people when they're upset? It helps. So I'm going to distract her. Okay, Morgan, tell me what, tell me what happened here today. Is, is there anybody I could bring here for you? I'm, making, I'm giving her an opportunity to make a decision. You know how credible? By the way, where did I learn that? I hate to tell you where I learned that. I learned that as a sexual assault investigator. I found the most important thing to talk to a sexual assault investigator is letting her get control of her life again and asking her questions. Who can be here? What can, da, 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 not giving her orders. So my demonstration there is just to show where, where I'm uh, going with this. Hey, we're on time. I don't believe it. The culture of police work often goes against improving stress-related health problems. The police culture doesn't look favorably on people who have problems. Not only are you supposed to be superhuman if you're an officer, but you fear asking for help. Officers reveal that they suffer from a chronic disease or health deficiency, may lose financial status, professional reputation, or both. The solution needs to start at the academy level with training uh, that helps officers understand the signs of stress and how to get them treated. Education is also necessary for police leadership and management, which is not supporting this very well. And, and to accept officers who ask for the help for their help issues. This is very difficult. We're finding that peer support, peer training is helping out a lot, 
but we're, we're still finding uh, officers suffering in, in, in silence. Lieutenant Gurley, I'm going to ask you to stand up, and I'm going to give this to you. Can you help me out? I talked about compassion. You made a comment about compassion and uh, empathy. And some other, can you just give an introduction of, of the training that we're doing right now in Oregon? So just real quickly with regard to compassion, you know, um, emotional intelligence and compassion, as the chiefs have talked about, is very critical. And so 15 years ago, I sat on a quest to really to, to find how do we train that? You know, you can't put cops in a room and tell them be compassionate. I mean, you can, and that's what we do, but it doesn't work. And it's not because we don't want to be compassionate. It's because of all these other factors that Ron alluded to, and, and many we haven't, to be honest with you. Our scorecard on health and well-being is really, really poor. Uh, we would not graduate if it were a requirement to do well. Um, there's lots of data that suggests that we don't really have the capacity to be compassionate. So um, really, ultimately, at the end of the day, the interventions that work are mind-body related. And they're preventative. So teaching mindfulness, teaching meditation, actually is a gateway to teach things like compassion. Now, you can't necessarily teach someone to be compassionate, but you can teach the skills necessary, self-awareness, self-regulation, self-compassion, in order for people to make choices about how they want to show up in the world. And that's really, in short, what we're doing through meditation training. Thanks, Lieutenant. I appreciate it. OK, I'm going to turn it back to um, we're doing great. We're actually staying on time. Pete, can you believe that? Um, for this final session and final part of it, uh, there's a lot more material here that, that I've downloaded for you. You could read it, it, it real quick. This shows that I, you know, I, uh, I, th these are different agencies using uh, the mindfulness. Look at Canada. The, these are officers preparing to go on duty. Look at that. Uh, so you'll be able to uh, uh, reference that. But what I want to do now in the little time that we have left is throw it out to the uh, uh, audience for uh, questions and answers. I could take it. Yes, ma'am. Let me give this to you. I feel like a game show host. Um, 27 years ago, I was a young mother with a three-year-old child, and I was psychotic. Um, I believed that a man was going to kill me and my son, took all my money from the bank, put my son in the car, and headed to Mexico. Um, it was a miracle that I was picked up by the Roseburg police. Uh, the police officer uh, that took me to the hospital gently told me to put my hands behind my back. He handcuffed me and gently said, you haven't done anything wrong. This is just protocol. And I remember that small act of kindness 27 years later. And he's probably retired. I don't know where he is in the world, but I would like to say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. Wasn't expecting that. Yeah. So with all of the training, my guess is not every officer buys into it. What happens to the officer or to the department or the training if, the, if you've got some who just really can't buy into it for whatever reason? Um, well, we have uh, the Eugene Police Department has body-worn video cameras, so every interaction is recorded from that perspective. They, uh, every car has in-car video. So there's a record of pretty much every conversation that an officer has, and there's which creates great opportunities for training. So our sergeants are bought into this. They wouldn't be promoted unless they were, and our lieutenants and captains and so on. So it, it's, a, it's been owned widely by the department. And I know from our some internal affairs investigations that were imperfect. You know, I've seen some bad behavior. Uh, but for the most part, it's been pretty successful. So you keep plugging away with them. Yes. Yeah. And, we, and we're hiring the right people, the kind of folks yeah. that want to be police officers now. For our, at least in our organization, they're the kind of people who think that this is the way they want to work. And I, I experienced that when I was training in California. Uh, I t you'll love this. I trained the San Francisco Police Department my hometown, and um, there's always going to be um, numbers of officers that might reject this. Or they were hired from another culture. Many police agencies replicate themselves, and they still are hiring officers from the 60s and 70s today. Uh, so what can be done also, in, and Pete's right, it's their performance and their behavior. Uh, is there a number that reject it? Yes. But you look at any police department, 
especially the size of Eugene and Hillsboro, and there's a certain percentage of police officers, thank God not a lot, that don't like people. How many of you have had teachers that didn't like students? You're all laughing. I know you are. By the way, I got kicked out of high school. She was wrong. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Skanderup. But uh, so it is difficult uh, in the sense that uh, there is a core there. And Pete's right. You all, if, if we hired the right people, if we p hired the people that, that would adhere to the value-driven organization and that would buy into and understand, hey, listen, I just want you to sleep better. Is that okay? If you sleep better, your decision-making judgment is going to be incredible. So there will be that number, but the bottom line, and Pete and I will tell you, the bottom line is their performance in the field. Because, you know, I've got officers in the department, they're idiots, they're racist, they're sexist, they're everything. But when they're in the field doing their job, they have to perform. And remember, this talks about performance. Keep in mind, we keep on talking about performance. How do we prepare people to perform properly? Get back. I'm not getting paid for this here. Um, along with the mindfulness component, I'm just wondering about mental health resources for officers. You know, I, I was lucky enough to participate in a um, military life counselor program where I was on base and I was like a roaming counselor, right? So it helped with confidentiality and people felt like they could kind of come to me. Um, but I just, I'm wondering about that component because I mean, yes, mindfulness is so important, but there's also that sort of self-care and the the stepping into the more sort of comprehensive, extensive treatment, right? Especially with the post-traumatic stress injury. So I'm just wondering about that. Sure, and I, I think most agencies do not have much available to them for that kind of thing. Uh, a number of years ago, we uh, started a chaplaincy program, and so we had, our department had three chaplains who are all pastors of successful parishes, and, which, and we were careful to only ch have chaplains who had successful and large parishes because they would have demonstrated an ability to navigate and help people in those kinds of things and get them to the help that they need. And they are a presence throughout the organization. And then we all have EAP, I mean, uh, employee assistance programs. Uh, but I think the modern police department is going to have a counselor on site in the building that people can go to. And probably the future, not immediately, will be mandatory psychological checkups annually. Or s every yeah, the, uh, it's a good question because... Uh, Sadly, um, we don't have that many resources. We do know that some well-trained peer support helps within an organization. Rich, do, are you aware of any agencies? You, Rich goes nationally, so he might, might have touched someone that's more enlightened besides me. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, so I'm going to be the naysayer here. The, uh, first of all, the system's broken. So you know, when I train mindfulness meditation and other things, I'm descriptive. In other words, I offer skills, I train skills, and say what these are for you is what they are for you, right? Ex and one exception. I tell first responders today that you must, you must, you need, you should find a mental health clinician and see them on a regular basis, whether you need them or not. This is a culture change that has to happen because the job's too hard. We cannot navigate. We've, uh, let's just look at our performance. Look at our health and well-being. Look at how we're relating with our communities or not. So this is a critical ingredient. And for this audience, I'm assuming you're all in the mental health community, most of you. So this is really, really important. The problem is, is that in order for me to do that with my health care, I have to have a diagnosis, right? So what's broken is the fact that first responders, in order to take advantage of what science tells us is a smart thing to do, mental health coaching, we have to go and use a system that is broken, and now I have to have a diagnosis in order to continue seeing a mental health clinician, unless I want to pay for it myself, right? So um, what has to happen is we have to have systematic changes or systems changes. Uh, I'm working currently with the Hillsborough Human Resources Department to figure out how do we provide a benefit package to firefighters and police officers that allows us to see a mental health clinician without a diagnosis. And also, so, so that's one thing. That's for me as a first responder. The organization, the chief's right, the organization needs to do um, psychological checks for their first responders. That is not helping me, however. Let's keep that in mind, right? So, so, that, so if you're a mental health clinician and you're seeing me because I work for 
the Hillsborough Police Department and the Hillsborough Police Department is paying you, you work for the department, not for me. And so understand that that's essentially a fit for duty exam, essentially. And um, you know, it's important, but we, we need that kind of accountability, but we also need the coaching that's critical. And so the systems are not set up for this yet, and we need to evolve into that arena. There's lots of obstacles. To you civilians, a fit for duty is career ending. It's frightening. Just right. I say cops are serial married. And that's really what happens. Well, if communication is a key, and I know there's therapists in this room and counselors, if communication is a key, and police officers are always calling the shot, gonna be kind of hard to communicate well. I'm just throwing it out. I'm not solving it. I'm just telling you that's the problem. What are some effective strategies, though, to intervene and reduce police officer impairment? Pete and I were both asked to present. We didn't compare our notes. We chatted on the phone, talked. But look what, look, what, look what I came up with. And Pete, your emotional intelligence of the officer. You acknowledge emotional intelligence to enhance the awareness of yourself and to avoid the posturing in language that riles and agitates. Those you're supposed to help. Um, one of my classes I teach at Portland Community College is Tactical Communication, Crisis Intervention. That's a book that's available to you. One of the assignments is during the term, they have to watch four COPS programs, uh, the, the, the live ones, you know, where they go out in the call. And by the end of the course, they, they know very well what the COP did wrong. And sadly, uh, these are very popular programs. But everything the COP does wrong you could identify as lacking emotional intelligence, lacking being in a value-driven department. So emotional intelligence, well, what does it mean? What's the ability to interpret and understand, manage your own emotions? Um, uh, becoming more aware of the triggers. The basically the ability to off, uh, for the officer to understand and manage personal emotions while in the midst of trying to solve someone else's problem, your clients. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. First responders. I worked, I worked, uh, I started out in corrections, which I actually dearly, I thought was fascinating. Um, it works with, first, this is first responders. There's firefighters in there, 911 operators, paramedics. Uh, please, please understand, I'm talking, it's a pretty big net, but, but all are dealing with this. Actually, I learned some of my better communication skills I learned in, in the jail, uh, corrections. Because if you're in your back by yourself, you better be good with your mouth and your behavior, and you better be honest. Yes, they're trying to con you. That's your job. But you better be fair and honest with them. If you're not, and start messing with them, you're going to regret it. So good. thank you for the question. Um, Self-compassion for police. Instead of understanding the impacts of anger, fear, police officers try to tamp down those emotions or ignore them, which keeps them from understanding the effect of emotion on a performance. Lieutenant Rich Gerling, I'll introduce him in a minute. So what is this emotional intelligence? Well, it's a shorthand that psychological researchers use to describe how well interview, uh, individuals can manage their own emotions and react to the emotions of others. People who exhibit emotional intelligence have the less obvious skills necessary to go get ahead in life, such as managing conflict resolution, reading and responding to the needs of others, and keeping their own emotions from overflowing and dis, uh, dis, uh, di disrupting their lives. You counselors and healthcare professionals out there in mental health care, that's, this is kind of you right here. You kind of are wired to do this. Uh, the cops aren't. That's why you're a little bit more successful than we are. This is why so many police officers mishandle the crisis call, right here. Many police officers are not effectively trained in how to manage conflict resolution. Is that shocking? A police academy, 12 weeks, 16, 18 weeks. The average police academy may only spend 5% of their time or less on crisis intervention training. 95% of our job is communication. We go to 100 calls of, of disturbance. 
You know, only two people go to jail. Two of those calls, they go to jail. You know that, don't you? The overwhelming majority of our calls are dealing with communication, people's emotions, but we're not training our officers in that. Now, what is the ideal police officer? Well, the person that understands self-awareness, self-management, motivation, empathy, and social skills. Just, I'm just listing that out. With Pete, it would be truly value-driven type of organization. Now, in Pete's case, the officer that may have bought the shoes has to be prepared to go out and, and maybe fight somebody or could restrain somebody that's being uh, obstinate or dangerous, but at the same time need to be able to show some of that empathy and compassion. Here's where I'm going with this. This is brand new in the police profession. Can yoga and meditation save police officers? It's really, I, that's, that's more for your consumption. It's mindfulness-based training. Here's where police department, I'm, I'm bragging about them, started this training in 2013. And uh, we're lucky in Oregon to have actually the founder of this type of training and now one of the leaders in it of the United States right, right here in Oregon. And by the way, I'm not embarrassed Rich. Rich is here. Rich, stand up, please. He's... My lieutenant used to work for me. I hired him. And I'm going to ask him to kind of comment on some of this. Police officers are suffering, said Lieutenant Gurney. There are so many distressors to being a police officer today. The job's incredibly complicated. The organizations are complicated. The legal climate is complicated. And our relationship with our public is complicated. We need to know how to exist within this crucible. I'm going to cultivate an empathic warrior culture, this is Lieutenant Gurney talking, that allows police officers to see somehow holding a sign that says, I can't breathe, and instead of responding with some defensive statement, it's really an inter inter interrogative. Tell me more about that, he says. He says, police officers are traditionally not suffering uh, training considered resilience. Problems with overaggressiveness by police are largely driven by the level of suffering behind the badge. Some of you may have never heard this. I totally, totally agree with that. So what is it? Well, a pilot study by Lieutenant Gerling and Dr. Uh, Michael Christopher of Pacific University found that in dealing with this type of training, the officers self-report significant improvement in mindfulness, resilience, uh, police and perceived stress, burnout, emotional intelligence, difficulties with emotional re regulation, mental health, physical health, anger, fatigue, and sleep disturbance. Is mindfulness-based training working? Sadly, at the end of my 33-year 33 year career, we started doing it. Uh, I wish I could start again as a chief and reintroduce this because we're not doing enough of it. But this echoes some of the other research of an earlier study which found that police officers who went through mindfulness training experience had less depression in their first year of service. Uh, a couple months ago, I had the privilege of going through a one-day session. By the way, um, private industry stepped up. Genetech uh, um, sponsors it for the public, uh, public, uh, public safety. And I went through it. And it was amazing to see these officers and the SWAT team members, officers that just had to take a life on duty, go through this training. And again, the purpose of our presentation, my presentation, is to talk about how to get over to here, which is where you pick it up, as, as, as uh, judges, people before your court, and healthcare professionals. What is it we're giving you in the police profession, but what is it we can do uh, to help? So if you're depressed, you're living the past. If you're anxious, you're living the future. If you're at peace, you're living in the present. And that's where we're going with this. We're trying to deal with a mindfulness-based model that deals with the here and now and the emotional intelligence. Now, and I'm getting toward the end of my presentation, which training models show the most promise in preparing the officers for the uncertainties of the crisis intervention call, the mental health call? And this is the uh, textbook that, that, you're all, all, uh, that I use um, uh, for, tra for teaching. Crisis intervention is narrowly defined as that situation when police officers are called to intervene in the lives of people who are experiencing an emotional crisis. Tactical communication is an inventory of specific words, phrases, nonverbal, verbal communication, and techniques used to calm people who are experiencing crisis. 
If we start off with Pete's officers and those inculcated values and send them to mindfulness-based training and crisis intervention training, hopefully we'll put some of you out of a job. And that's where we're going with this. Trouble is a lot of the professions not experiencing it. And of course, most police agencies tr focus on tactics and weapons, far less training. Uh, interesting, um, a couple years ago, uh, Oregon agency took someone's life needlessly, shot him. And when they interviewed the chief about the shooting, what are you going to do about this? The chief said, well, I'm going to increase uh, the firearms training. Well, he killed the guy. He's pretty good at it. He said the wrong stupid thing. I'm going to find out, did we have to take a life? Sound familiar? This type of training trains officers to do what's counterintuitive from the police academy. It is to step back, to pull back, and to communicate. That's what this is all about. To intervene quickly, stabilize, mediate if you have to, diffusing skills, facilitate problem solving and assist by helping others, communication skills. This is what we're not doing. Real communication can only occur between me and a person that's having a crisis. Real communication can only occur if I am listening with understanding. Mathematically, I have to talk 20% and he talks 80. Did you know that? Most people don't. So how can I communicate if I don't really know how to do it? If I'm shouting a command and I'm being aggressive and not diffusing or de-escalating, then there will be no real communication. And again, many of you in this room are professionally trained in communication. Again, the police are not trained. Post-traumatic stress injury. Why is this injury as a term more acceptable to the police and the military? Disorder is more of a label. An injury clarifies that the person has experienced something horrifying or traumatic and can recover from it. It's interesting, people talk about schizophrenia, and you always see it on TV. My experience with schizophrenia is people well-treated, medicated, are not violent at all. I don't know why those... That's always your suspect on TV. You ever notice that? I thought that, that was my experience. That was not. I don't understand it. Although the official term is post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, within the psychological community, we in police and military prefer a post-traumatic stress injury. Many servicemen and women hate the term disorder and suffer in silence rather than endure the label. Remember what Lieutenant Gerding just said, suffering in silence, sound familiar? The same is true of law enforcement. Labeling something as a disorder can suggest something negative about a person's character or something that can't be changed. And that's why we probably have to change the way we're thinking about this. Calling it injury clarifies that the person has unfortunately experienced something horrifying or traumatic but can recover for it, from it. Breaking the stigma about seeking mental health treatment is our goal as mental health professionals, Dr. Mar Marla Friedman. By all this material, I have all the, um, by the way, this is 2018. This is pretty hot off the press. So that pretty strong information about stigma and how do we move over from a position, uh, um, for, from a position of training and experience. Finally, and when I'm done here, before I open it up, I do have to ask uh, Lieutenant Gerling, who's now my guru in this stuff, to speak a little bit up on what I presented. And Pete and I both presented about compassion. By the way, empathy. Some say you can't train compassion, you can't train empathy. I'm a former hostage negotiator. I spent seven years in San Francisco Bay Area as a negotiator. At the very least, train your officers in empathic responses so they can't communicate. Watch this. I'm going to do the go for one and get a clarification. Oh, yeah, he can come back to job. Yeah, right. So what Rich is saying is very difficult um, in that we have to change the culture, that, it, that it's okay to deal with many of these issues that we're dealing with in stress. Hopefully, again, uh, the last time I went through the training a couple months ago at Genetech, who sponsored it uh, for government employees, um, we had a lot of people there. And they were coming out acknowledging this is okay to be here. 
And, and this isn't a fit-for-duty exercise. This is so I could sleep better, so I could communicate better with my, my, uh, my loved one, my partner. That's what, that's what I'm doing here. One officer, so he could deal with the death. He just had to take a life. He had to take a life. In an absolute unavoidable situation, man coming to him, throwing, shooting a gun. And he had to deal with it. But he, was, he would rather deal with it in going through the training, actually, that Lieutenant Gerling gave, um, which was really helpful. So other questions that we have here? Oh, yes, great. Chief, you mentioned uh, having served in the Marine Corps yourself. And um, I guess I have a, a series of questions, so bear with me, please. Now that we're into let's see, the 17th year of the global war on terror, I would imagine that you have a good number of officers in either department who have been deployed overseas in the global war on terror. Um, this is something that I've personally wondered. Has either one of you ever seen a um, more of a willingness in someone who has ser served overseas in a combat zone to go for the firearm as opposed to go for conflict resolution. That's a heck of a question. Uh, I've, I've heard that concern, and it absolutely is not what I've seen in performance. And I haven't seen, and I was starting to hire from the Gulf War, and by the way, that's, uh, that's Commander Gerling, United States Coast Guard. Uh, there is a difference, though, and I'm going to share it personally. Um, I came back as a 19-year-old as a Marine from Vietnam. We were, they were hiring Vietnam veterans. There was a difference, because when we came back, we believed in fire superiority. And when we became a civilian cop, we still believed in it. And i got to tell you something. Our trained military today is so far better than my military. Um, so to answer your question, Judgment, life experience is incredible. I get these, I call them kids, because I always tell people, Harry Truman was the president when I was born. I give you a little idea how old I am. It's just fantastic. I, I admire them. And their decision making, and their dis decision to make take a life is so much at a higher level than police officers in America. Do you all know that? So to answer your question, I find it so much better than when, when I was there. My whole SWAT team, I was on SWAT team, we were, all, we were all Vietnam War veterans. So we didn't think anything about throwing a flash grenade at Bang or, or, or popping a, po a bunch of rounds into a house or a trailer. Didn't think anything about it. That's, that's the way we're trained. And we did it in those days. We did it in those days. Oh, situation resolved, we shot the guy. So answer your question, sleep well tonight. Our contemporary veterans are so far better trained they're more mature, and they have a much better understanding of use of force than American police officers. Their, their use of force, as a matter of fact, when I have one of my training in, in Portland Community College, I bring in an act, uh, he's a reserve gunnery sergeant, uh, or mass, a master sergeant in the Army. He comes in and gives a presentation on use of force, and their, their higher use of force threshold than American policing. What a heck of a question. So, good news, current contemporary veterans, very well trained, very mature, and I'm very delighted to say it's not gender-based because we got a lot more women and men both coming back. Another question, we're running down in time, but a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, so I just wanna really appreciate what you guys have shared, um, especially around some of the idea of using like peer support. So I'm a peer support specialist within the mental health world, and Frankly, some of the things you were just mentioning about that culture ship and, and like using the term disorder in terms of the peer movement or consumer movement and, and wanting our voices and perceptions heard, those are areas where we don't feel heard a lot of the time also. So I don't know if you guys were aware of that and there was a movement that way, but I guess for those who are in the mental health field and legal fields here is you know, just that whole peer medical model and disease oriented, disorder oriented, um, it, it, it's just hard to live with and work with, and it does help add to that discrimination, um, which 
can be really hard. The idea of you guys using peer support, and I don't know if you know, there, there is actually you know a process for people to become peer support specialists in our state. The idea of having peers specific to within like a law enforcement agency I think is really interesting. And then I also wanted to just, I know when we're in different fields, we sometimes make assumptions. And so I know you were saying like, you guys, because you're in mental health, are better with some of that talking stuff. I can tell you I work at the state hospital, and I know one of the things that bothers me the most is we have training available to people every day, and it's mandatory every year about what to do when you have to go hands-on. But we also know most of what we do is to avoid going hands-on. But we do not have training every day or annual training about what you do to make sure you do not have to go hands-on. So also we, we would like more of that also. By the way, the smartest person I know in crisis intervention and dealing with uh, this, uh, anybody, go to, go to a psychiatric nurse and listen to what he or she has to say um, uh, about how to do that. Uh, any more? Because we have running out of time. Uh, one more, then we have to go. Pete and I aren't getting paid for this. You know that, don't you? Sorry. <laughs> I'm just curious. Um, with what we know about the uh, mindfulness, and I know that a lot of the agencies are going to that. Does DPSST um, buy into that? The question is, did the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training buy into it? Um, I'd have to ask actively uh, Lieutenant Gerling, who has communication right now. Rich, what would you say about DPSST? Final question. Wow, the last question. Uh, we don't know. Um, I, I think um, this is so new. This, they haven't had the opportunity to adopt anything. And I'm in some conversations with folks at DPSST to kind of explore that. But this really is the wild, wild west with mindfulness. There's a lot of, there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of BS around it, frankly. Um, and uh, we're trying to figure out what are the right models to bring it in. And you know, uh, I think that th I, I do see a future where DPSST integrates some of this training into um, into the various academies that they offer. But right now, it's uh, it's so new, it's not there. Chief, any parting words before we call her today? No, you can leave. Mine, thank you. Mine's charged, but thank you for listening. Hey, everybody, thank you very, very much. We appreciate it. Thank you.